Hello, I'm Kevin Cameron, one of your Marion County Commissioners, and this is another edition of Marion County Today. And October is Domestic Violence Awareness Month. However, I'm not sure we should just limit that to one month out of every year. It should be all the time we need to be aware and, and uh, help with this particular situation. Today with me is Jane Downing. She is the Executive Director of S for Center for Hope and Safety. And uh, I was just reading an article uh, in, in the magazine, Jane, that says you're celebrating your 20th year. So maybe you can tell us a little bit about your background. And, and there were some pictures of you that, for, <laughs> from the first day to, to today, which are uh, quite different. But you've seen a lot over your years. So why don't you tell us a little bit about I your have. career? I, I've been privileged to to spend 20 years providing services to victims of domestic violence, sexual assault, stalking, and human trafficking. And, and it's hard for me to believe sometimes that it's been 20 years. Sometimes it feels like two weeks and other times it feels like forever. Um, but um, over the years, it certainly has, uh, the work has changed. Um, we When I first came on, we received about 7,000 contacts a year to our program. We had one computer for all of our staff, and, and we had at that time, I think, uh, seven or eight staff members. And last year, just, um, just this last fiscal year, we had more than 22,000 contacts to our program. Um, we have 18 staff now, and everyone has a computer. So um, certainly in that regard, um, times have changed. And, and luckily, the awareness has certainly changed. So I appreciate you talking about that we need to think about it more than just one month of the year because we really do. Um, it's an issue that touches our schools, our workplaces, um, so many different areas of our day-to-day -day lives are affected by domestic violence that we need that awareness all the time. Sure, so so maybe you can tell us about, you, you mentioned it's gone from 7,000 contacts to 22,000 mm -hmm. this last year. Tell us about the contacts and mm -hmm. how that process works uh, yeah. at Center for Hope and Safety. Absolutely. So at that time and even today, I would say the majority of our contacts come through our 24-hour crisis line. We answer that in English and Spanish. We also use the language line so we t can talk to folks in 140 different languages. We really want to remove as many barriers as possible for people reaching out and getting services. And so um, that 24-hour crisis line is still the majority of ways in which um, people contact us. But we moved our advocacy office um, about three years ago to the downtown town core and um, in our first year we doubled the number of people walking in to get services and in the second year we doubled again wow. and so location is everything um, and we've come to realize that being in that downtown core area has made all the difference for people seeing us knowing where to come for services and they're they're walking in in record numbers for us um, contacts also can be through Facebook um, our website um, lots of different, we try to have as many ways as possible for folks to be able to reach out and get services and help that they need. Yeah, I've toured your place. It's, it's an amazing uh, mm -hmm. facility that you have and you've done a great job there. I just really appreciate it. It's not too far from our office, just a couple it's blocks not, away. Yeah. So. It's not, yeah. It's walking distance. Yeah, so um, is it open for people to come and get tours or some people can get tours? Absolutely. Or, yeah. We love giving um, folks from the community a tour to see. We just I just had one earlier today. Um, a group came through and to see what we do and how we do it. Um, sometimes people don't want to come because they think we have actually have the families there right. and we don't. Right. Um, people walk in and get services, but we have private rooms where we can meet with them. Um, but our families stay in an undisclosed location at, at a shelter. And so they don't have to worry if they come on a tour that they're gonna be you know, walking through where people live. We yeah. don't have them living yeah, you there. Protect their, protect them for that. Yeah, absolutely. Well, why don't you tell us a little bit about the myths that, that, uh, that surround domestic mm -hmm. violence? Yeah, so one of the greatest myths that there is is that, um, that people are out of control. They're angry when this happens. And we actually know they're very much in control of what they're doing. And we know this for several different reasons. One is if someone knocks on the door, the phone rings, can they stop? Just like that. Very often when law enforcement shows up, he's sitting back all calm, cool, and collected. 
and and the victim is often the one that looks hysterical and i i did say he is perpetrator because that's most often but it can be the other way around too and we help all victims of of domestic violence and um and so it's because they can stop we also know they only they aren't doing it to people who um quote make them angry out in public they wait in and they go home and they do it to the person they say that they love very often with domestic violence there's target punching and kicking so they they actually direct that domestic the the punches and kicks to places that won't show if you're out of control if you're in a rage you're not going to be able to direct where those punches and kicks go another huge myth is that if you see it as a child you're going to grow up and you're going to perpetrate violence yourself the vast majority of children who witness grow up and say it's not going to happen to my kids it's not going to happen to any other kids if i can help it and they usually go into volunteer opportunities or professions where they make a difference for children and if you think about it it doesn't make any sense if every child who witnessed grew up in the next generation and became a perpetrator we'd already be at 100 percent perpetrators there wouldn't be anybody left and so um, that's a that's a horrible thing to say to little boys you know you're you're going to grow up and automatically become an abuser right. if you witness that and so it's much more empowering to say, you know, you don't have to do those things. You can make a different choice. And so we work with a lot of children and it's, they're scared that they're going to grow up and do those same things. So it's really good to get that message out there of saying, you don't have to do that. Um, you can make a different choice for yourself. And of course, alcohol and drugs is another one of those myths. Why, why don't you tell us a little bit about um the uh, services that you actually provide mm -hmm. sure. in the in the sure. facility or uh, mm -hmm. with your your organization. Yeah, so we have that 24-hour crisis line. Mm -hmm. We have a safe shelter that operates 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. We have anywhere from 250 to 500 children and adults that stay with us, and typically one half of our shelter is children, and we provide everything for them: food, clothing, hygiene items, school supplies, whatever they need. They most often come to us with the clothes on their back and not much more. And mm -hmm. And we also do really intensive case management with them to help them get um, back on their feet. Um, we have support groups. We have them in English and Spanish. We have them in Salem and in Woodburn. We provide free child care for all of those support groups. We also have um, community um, outreach and education. We train anywhere from seven to 10,000 people a year. And we do all that for free. We go into businesses and help them safety plan for if they're afraid domestic violence might come into their workplace. Um, we uh, are in the schools. Our youth services coordinator goes around to the school and does training on um, teen dating violence, sexual assault, human trafficking to help prevent it, mm -hmm. and um, also pornography. How, do, how can youth um, help um, you know, understand what the dangers are of that? And so she's in the schools. She trains anywhere from three to 4,000 youth every year. We wow. know youth are going to talk to other youth, so she actually meets with them. We have a court um, advocate who is in every day in the courthouse, and that's actually um, been a change in uh, the last couple, couple years. years. Right. Yeah, and the commissioners were very um, uh, a big part of having that happen, where we have an advocate there every single day, and so it helps with protection orders, helps walk them through that process. So, um, and then the other thing we have is co-located advocates in DHS offices, so child welfare, self-sufficiency. And I think some of the things you just talked, one of the things you just talked about, about the court, uh, being able to not have to be in the court mm -hmm. with, the, with the perpetrator is mm -hmm. a really important thing. We yeah. learned through some of the, the um, research that we did, led by Commissioner Carlson. I think you're going to get a chance to talk a little bit more about that. And the funding from... Mm -hmm. uh, uh, justice reinvestment that yes. we've been able to put towards uh, victims assistance mm -hmm. as well. Why don't you tell us, uh, we've got just a little bit more time in this segment, why don't you tell us about future plans uh, for the center? Yeah, so we um, we have the new advocacy office. We opened a new shelter this year. We needed one very badly, so we did that. Um, but we have some wonderful plans for the future. We actually have purchased the Greyhound building and we're going to um, tear it down. We're gonna have three stories. Um, on the first story is going to be businesses, but they can't just be businesses to be businesses. They have to partner with us. And so providing job training or services for the folks we serve. And then the next two floors are going to be transitional housing. There's a huge need for housing. Sure. And we're excited to have one that 
they can go from our shelter into um, you know low income rentals, but they're going to be nice and and family friendly and and then they'll be connected with the downtown and services and right yeah. next door to us. So. And it'll be a nice upgrade for that block as yeah. well. It'd be so yeah. that's a long term plan. Uh, obviously, there's a capital campaign that's going to take place at some point in time. Maybe it's taking place now. Or it's not. Seed money. It's okay. not yet. No, we're well. we're we're gonna you know t it's going to be a little um, time because we know there's lots of things going on in the community, right. so. Well, well, thank you, and, and thank you for your 20 years of service uh, in this particular area. Thank you. Really appreciate your time today. Oh, appreciate it. We're back with Paige Clarkson, and we're gonna be talking still about domestic violence awareness and uh, all of the wonderful programs that we have and ideas for prevention. Paige, welcome. Thank you, nice to be here. Uh, so. Before we get into the content, I know you've been at the district attorney's office for many years. You could probably tell us how many. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Sure. Uh, well, I've worked at the DA's office for 20 years and have sort of prosecuted all different types of crime, um, but certainly started my career uh, in the domestic violence field, working with uh, victims and survivors of domestic violence, um, have handled all sorts of uh, criminal behavior related to intimate partner violence and that type of family-related uh, crimes and uh, and now find myself in a position where I uh, I'm excited to be able to support those efforts in my role now very good mm -hmm. so it really in the district attorney's office there are a couple different roles the one you talked about the domestic violence unit which right. maybe you could tell us a little bit more about what Absolutely. they do and also the victim assistance right. uh, unit. so right. our, our office of victims assistance so tell us a bit about those you know one of the great things about working at the Marion County DA's office is really the priority we have set with children and families and specifically in support of victims of domestic violence um, uh, starting with Dale Penn uh, before Walt Beglaw was the uh, was the district attorney uh, that has always been a priority as long as I have worked there to make sure that we're helping families. Uh, we have a specific unit of very specially trained prosecutors whose job it is to deal solely with domestic violence cases. Uh, so we see uh, victims of all sorts of, um, of backgrounds, of all sorts of socioeconomic resources um, in varying states um, of marriage or um, family status who find themselves uh, in, in these situations where they need the help of the criminal justice system to navigate uh, an offense of domestic violence. Our prosecutors are very specially trained to manage those cases and they're difficult. They're fraught with a lot of issues and a lot of challenges, um, but understanding the dynamics of domestic violence violence is key to that and our prosecutors in the DA's office really understand those issues. Similarly, we would not be as successful as we are with those uh, prosecutions were it not for our Victim Assistance Division. Uh, Marion County places extreme importance on being able to help victims not just through the criminal justice process, but also giving them resources to make their families healthier, make them better, plan for their safety and their continuation even after uh, the perpetrator has been held accountable in a criminal justice setting. Um, we find those are really key to making sure that the families remain healthy, that the choices are different going forward, and that they stay safe and are able to raise their children and raise their families in a, in a safe, healthy environment. So you have a lot of volunteers on the victim assistance side, which is the last segment, so I don't want to go into right. too much more detail on that. But Yes, uh, we have many volunteers who donate thousands of hours, and as prosecutors, we really call them the heart of our office. Mm -hmm. um, they're the huggers. Um, they're, um, they're the ones that get those phone calls and those, um, those, stress, uh, those moments of stress and strife, and they really provide uh, a lot of very personal service all the way through the criminal justice system, uh, including protective orders or those seeking protective orders and including help for those that need other types of services outside of the criminal justice system. Very good. So in Marion County, we have, as you've talked about, some great partnerships between yes. our Victim Assistance Office, Center for Hope and Safety, Jane right. Downing was just on, right. uh, and then also Liberty House. Correct. We have a Victim Assistance uh, I think a domestic violence focused person with parole and probation. Correct. There's a staff person that works with the Salem Police Department that works on domestic mm -hmm. violence cases. So all of those folks are very well connected. And a few years ago, we were contacted by a constituent, she's actually on the board of Liberty House, mm -hmm. that was interested in uh, bringing Casey Gwynn to our area. And Casey is with the Alliance for Hope. They're out of San Diego. Right. They do a lot of national work. Uh, and so Casey and a team brought two other people with them, came mm -hmm. and really looked at our array of services, including the juvenile department, right. even which they were very impressed with, right. and then came up with a report with some recommendations. Right. And I think, uh, 
you know, it was kind of the idea that you can you can be good, but but there are always things that you can do to improve, or you can be great, but there are things that you can do to improve. And Absolutely. and so, uh, so a few things, and I'll just tell a quick story, and then I wanted to get Please, your yeah. your read on kind of how what's happened since then. Sure. So I was able to go along with them to court, mm -hmm. and there was uh, a couple cases of restraining orders where women came and told just. Uh, very scary stories about what they were experiencing. Uh, one young woman who was sharing custody of a child with visitation, and the and the father of the child cornered her and kind of you know come in, come inside if you want to get the child, and then you know threatening her. Mm -hmm. Another one where the uh, the husband, ex husband, uh, had been I think eight tours of duty to Iraq, mm -hmm. suffering from PTSD, mm -hmm. living in a car, uh, and she was just really afraid for what he might do to the family and some of the things that he had said. And at the time, because of our resource issue, we didn't have an advocate in the right. courtroom. But we were able through uh, the identification of that through Casey's report right. and then through the justice reinvestment. Kevin just talked about that in the last segment. Mm -hmm. And now there's an advocate there every right. single restraining order hearing. Right. So that's a real success story for us. So tell us some other Absolutely. things that we have have uh, experienced because no, of that No, that's a perfect example of when you take a look at a program and look at maybe where some of the gaps are and be able to fill them. And that, um, that uh, money through uh, justice reinvestment was key to us being able to get somebody in the courtroom that we share with the Center for Hope and Safety to help through those restraining orders. And um, if for no other reason than to answer really simple questions about a process that can be really confusing mm -hmm. and very daunting for a victim who is otherwise dealing with a lot of other stress um, in her life. Uh, other things that we took a look at um, are the ability for victims, for example, to appear by video mm -hmm. um, in restraining order hearings. So specifically, uh, that has solved a lot of high stress situations in a contested hearing situation where the victim or the the petitioner who's trying to seek a protective order is really in fear and does not want to appear in the same room or be in the same space um, as her, the perpetrator or the person for whom, against whom she's seeking an order. We've uh, we've we've changed that. We allow them now to appear by video in a separate private space. Uh, it makes the uh, the hearings really less tense tension filled, uh, less stress for the victims and the uh, families of the victim to be able to manage that situation and really less stress for the court system in general when you don't have those people in the same room. And I think that's encouraged some victims to want to come and participate in that process and keep themselves safe despite their own concerns um, about, about seeing their perpetrator. Um, we have uh, done other things like the court has really committed itself to helping connect victims with outside services. So uh, before they would just come and process paperwork and get them through the system and get them through the court system. Now they're very proactive. The courts have been very interested in making sure they connect victims to things like Center for Hope and Safety, other outside resources that can help with housing and child care. Um, those are, are, are vital issues to victims of domestic violence who feel like they don't have a lot of, lot of other options um, when their and their spouse or their partner is no longer a part of their life. Uh, that has really brought light to the fact that we can help them in other ways besides just protective orders. Yes, and the, the one woman that I saw that had the, the ex-husband with PTSD, she had left her children home that day, right. um, and the paperwork had to be filed by 10 o'clock, which meant she got there in the morning. Then she stayed because the hearing wasn't until 2 mm -hmm. o'clock, yeah. Mm -hmm. And then when uh, Casey Gwynn and were asking her if she wanted to develop a safety plan and go to Center for Hope and Safety, she said, I don't have time. Right. I've got to get home to my children. I've been gone all day. So that right. child care uh, really becomes a critical part. Absolutely. And coordinating all those services so that there's more of a one-stop shop for things like that, or at least one place you can go to get some answers and mm -hmm. know where to go next. Mm -hmm. um, not feeling alone in this process, feeling that you have an advocate, feeling that you have people who are willing to help you through the process is really key to success for some of these women and families of getting healthy, getting better, and getting in a safe situation. That's great. Well, I know the district attorney's office has been on the forefront of advocating for people who experience domestic violence and also for prevention and what we can do to perhaps not see as many cases in court. Is there anything else you want to add to what we've talked you about? You know, doing? I think just that we're all very lucky to live in Marion County, to live in a county where we consider each other partners in this process and are willing to work together to use those services uh, and help people get safer, get healthier, and, and lead more productive lives in that regard. We're very fortunate here. Great. Well, thank you so much Thanks. for being on the program and yeah, for all you okay. do. Thank you. I'm Sam Brentano, our commissioner, and we're continuing our, our story series here on domestic violence. Uh, 
I have Jane Downing who's been here with us in one segment and Paige Clarkson from District Attorney's Office. But Jane, just personal with you, I have to tell you something. Uh, I first met you 2003, I got appointed to a committee that I still want, I think they just wanted me to know stuff about the county. And it was a coordinating committee with defense attorneys, uh, uh, victims, advocates, uh, Judge Rhodes, and I, I tried my best and I didn't know anything. I probably still don't, that's fair, but I spotted you right off as someone who did and I've relied on it all these years. Thank you. So I wanted to start with that, but we're, we're really supposed to talk about uh, the volunteer opportunities and I'm going to get to it after I ask one more question because we meet, uh, we have uh, domestic violence month, we do proclamations all through these, now it's been 13 years. I'd like to know things are getting better mm -hmm. and do I know that or how will I know it? Yeah, and um, that's a really good question. I would tell you that things are getting better in that we've built in awareness yeah. about this issue. It used to be people would say, that's a family issue. You don't talk about it. You don't get help. Um, you wouldn't believe how many people come to me and say, there weren't shelters when I was going through this. Um, I didn't have any place to turn. And so I only had the option of staying. And so when you think about that, um, it's it's so good that those numbers go up and up because really if you're addressing an issue well, the numbers have to go much higher before they ever start to come down. We're gonna get there. I believe we're gonna get there. But we still have people who will say, um, I didn't know there were services. No. I thought it was my fault that it was happening. And so we, we aren't quite there yet where we should say, okay, now we're gonna start to see that decline in numbers. We work every day to put ourselves out of a job. And someday I hope that I don't have a job, our agency doesn't have a job, but in the meantime. So when you retire, then I know things got better? <laughs> Is that the key? No, hopefully, I think that will happen before <laughs> okay. we're done. But, oh. but if you think about it, you know, if, isn't it great that we have the services that we need and that we're working with community partners in the meantime? Until we get to that day where we say, you know what, I don't think this is an issue anymore. It's great that we have the coordinated response that we have in our community to help I, those that are being victimized. I do hope it's getting better. Yeah. But now let's get, I, I have to get on subject, they always yeah, make me. That's okay. And the subject is volunteers in two different portions, and I'll start with you, Jane, if you mm -hmm. wouldn't mind, the volunteer opportunities yeah. that you have and who you're looking for and how they get in touch with you. Yeah, we love volunteers. They're actually the backbone of our organization. 75% um, of our hotline and shelter services are provided by volunteers. We um, want volunteers that want to come in and just help us in the office with data input or sorting donations. Um, but we have some uh, people that go through about 50 hours of training before they ever get to talk with someone. We want them to be well trained. And so we're looking for folks who are willing to take a hotline shift a month and go oh, through that training in order to do it. Doesn't have to every week, every day? Nope, nope. Okay. just once a month is what we ask. Um, and, uh, and so that they will be there for someone and they get to do it in their home. Um, they're not coming to our office and sitting in front of a phone and waiting for it to ring. If no calls come in, they get to sleep, but if a call comes in, they answer it and they help that person. I was just on a call last night, um, but that our, our volunteer was on a call already and so another call came through to me um, and they always have a backup person to help them, but volunteers really provide so many services to the folks that we serve. And then we have groups that just come in and say, let's, you know, what we wanna I do, do a project, yeah, clean, you know, clean our flower beds or something. So we always look nice and, you know, so volunteers are okay. just so necessary in lots of different ways. And are you getting the ones you need or you can just always need more? We work? always need always more. Need I more. don't know any nonprofit that won't <laughs> say they can always use more. So, so Paige, with the county and your, well, you, right. would you go through what the program is yeah, and who absolutely. you're looking for? Well, we have a victim assistance division, and you know, when you asked, um, how do we know it's getting better? I guess one way that we know it's it's doing, we're doing well or we're doing good work is that every year, every volunteer cycle, we have more people oh. that want to come in and want to help. And so, when you talk about awareness and you talk about people being interested in this topic, we're seeing more of that all the time, and that's really encouraging um, from uh, from at least a, a government standpoint. Uh, 
We provide services with our volunteers. We have about 50 to 60 at any given time. Uh, they help, help over 4,000 victims every year. They give over, uh, I think we're up to about 20,000 hours um, of volunteer work every year. Um, they really are, as I said earlier, the heart of our organization and um, are so helpful all the way through the very beginning of the criminal justice system process. They will sit through court hearings. They will help the victim understand the process, understand what can be a lengthy, stressful situation. Um, they will help her with services, and I say her because most of the time it's um, it's women that we're helping as victims of domestic violence, though we will help anybody that finds themselves in that situation. They will help them through the protective order uh, process, seeking orders so that their perpetrator stays away and is legally required to do so. Uh, they will help them all the way through sentencing and uh, services that that family might need afterwards. Um, our uh, advocates are mu very much in tune with the services that are um, available through um, programs like Center How many for Hope people and do we have that, that do this? We have about 50 to 60 oh, at any goodness. given time. Um, and we, we and average how busy about do that. they keep? Really busy. Mm -hmm. um, you keep there's 50 or 60 people. Plenty mm -hmm. to do. Um, there's a significant training uh, process that I you have to go ask through. That next. Yep, about 48 hours of training with additional 16 hours um, if you want to help uh, victims of domestic violence, an additional 16 if you want to help child victims. Um, we ask that they be available for some daytime shifts because, of court, course, court happens during the daytime and you have to be available to hold hands during that period of time. Um, but uh, as far as special qualifications go, we just we want people with a heart that want to help people that understand the issue or are willing to get educated about it. Um, but uh, like Jane said, there's always room for more volunteers and more people to help. And so uh, we look for people with um, that integrity and that trustworthiness where victims are willing to tell them things they might not be comfortable telling other people. Um, and, uh, and I'm impressed every, every cycle with how many people we get that fit that bill. Wow. So. Both of you talked about training, but yeah, but yeah, and it's fairly extensive. Where, who provides that? Where do they go? How, right. What does it entail? Mm -hmm. Well, we we provide the training okay. for our volunteers, and um, we do it right on site at our advocacy office. And um, we also give them homework, so they're um, watching videos and doing things at home also um, during that. Right. And same with us, we provide in-house training, and uh, they can contact our office. I think the number will be on the screen at some point okay. to make that contact. Mm -hmm. um, they can contact us and we'll set you up with our wonderful volunteer coordinator Kathy Beach who puts on an amazing program uh, to help uh, to help folks get into this mm -hmm. get into this line of work all the time so we're happy to take them they've asked me to come up with a closing statement and I'm not the <laughs> one but you two are but where are we going and what's your thoughts or each get 30 seconds I'll give it that way great I think you know as the community um, gets more involved in these issues we are going to reach a time where we can say you know we are we are um, reaching that time when we can end violence in our community. It takes everybody working together and holding uh, perpetrators accountable and providing support to victims. And so um, we just appreciate anybody that wants to get involved and help us. There's plenty of work to do right now and um, we'll just keep working together. We, right. we kind of talk about no wrong door to coming into mm -hmm. services. We work really closely with victim assistance and, and the prosecutor's office and that's important in our community. Right. Right. From I guess from a prosecutor's perspective, you know the number one job um, in for us is is public safety, is community safety. And there's no better way to do that than to work with programs like this to help both prevent and then hold people accountable that offend against these uh, against these laws. And we do both. Um, both are important to us. And making sure that um, these women, these families, these victims are healthy going forward always a priority, holding the offender accountable so that we can stop it in the future, also a number one priority. And we do that really well together. Thank you. Thank you both. I heard you say prevent, but to protect and continue to. Absolutely. I hear that in both mm -hmm. your comments. Thank you. Again, thank you both. And thanks for being here. Thank, thank you. you.